Hello there folks, welcome back to the Chaps Guide. My name is Ash and I'm your host on this journey through men's style, self-development and personal grooming. Now today you join me in a corner of my home office because I'm going to do a Q&A video on general Chaps advice because I am delighted to receive the many comments and questions every day from you viewers, uh, either by leaving me a comment in the, the general comment section on each video, or you can send me an email directly using the email address you will find in the about section on our main YouTube channel page. Uh, so I've got a load of questions, I've saved them up, and today I'm going to go through as many as I can. So this might take a little while, but there's a good cross-section of questions in here from many different topics. So our first question comes from Brian McDonnell and I should say I've got my laptop here so if you see me glancing off to the side I'm not being impertinent, I'm merely reading these comments. So Brian McDonnell says, I have one question I would like to ask. Do you have a preference for writing paper for letter writing? I now use Lamy All-Star fountain pens after seeing your review video. The paper I have is of such poor quality that I feel you're the man to help me raise my game. Thankfully, uh, respectfully, Brian. Well, Brian, it's a great question and I totally agree with you. There is a whole different tier of enjoyment of communicating with people when you do so with the written word. It is such an impactive way of entering into a dialogue with friends, relatives, passing a message. You know, if somebody's had a promotion, sending them a handwritten note is so much better than dropping them an email. Or certainly if there's been a bereavement, a letter uh, or card of condolence written in your own hand conveys that personal message in such a better way than any electronic version of communication. So to that end, I'm delighted you've started using the Lamy All-Star Fountain Pen. It's one of my favorites. I use them every day and at such a modest price, they represent great entry level into the fountain pen world. But when you've got a good fountain pen, you need something to write on. And you're right, if you use um, ink on cheap paper of low quality, it's gonna bleed right through it and it's not gonna look very good at all. So it's worth investing a little bit of money and buying some decent stationery. Now my stationer choice is an old classic that's been around for a long time. It's British heritage company called Smithsons. Um, they've got a, a shop on Bond Street in London but they've got a fabulous website where you can buy all sorts of stationery. They also do other um, accessories for gentlemen as well like leather briefcases, notebooks and things like that but they're primarily regarded for their good quality paper and I've got some here because I use Smithsons um, stationery all the time. They've got this wonderful, uh, If I, sorry, I should say this is some of their standard um, paper inside this little box, which I will open. And there we see, this is a lovely ivory colored paper, very high quality. When you write on it using a fountain pen, it's an absolute dream. And they always send you your paper supplies in these lovely cardboard boxes. And this is their, um, their corporate color, which is called Nile Blue. Uh, and you can recognize things straight away that have come from Smithsons if they're in this quite highly identifiable blue box. Um, Smithsons have the royal warrant when it comes to the supplying of stationery. So you know the Queen, and looking at the, the symbols of the Royal Warrant here, also the Prince of Wales and formerly the Duke of Edinburgh also selected Smithsons as their stationer of choice. High quality paper never allows the ink to bleed through to the other side, so really good quality and worth, worth the money. As ever, not cheap, you know, but I think it's something like £19 for 50 sheets of A4 top quality writing paper. So um, very modest in price when you think about the amount of uh, good value you get for that price. So there you go, sir. Smithsons of Bond Street, look them up. Best writing paper I have found so far. Okay, my next question is a bit more of a personal sort of chap question and it's from James William Campbell who asks, Hi Ash, what is your morning routine to get you going and motivated throughout the day? Cheers from Canada. 
Well, cheers and a salute to you too, sir, in Canada. Uh, well, my morning routine, uh, it does vary, but I certainly have regularity in my routine. Every day I rise at 6 a.m., which is the time I start my day pretty much every day of the week. I'm an early riser, I tend to go to bed fairly early, normally before 11 p.m., so I'm up at 6 a.m. and I start my day with breakfast, so I eat porridge with fresh fruit, I have a cup of tea, and then that's me fueled up for whatever lies ahead. Now, three days a week, I take my exercise first thing in the morning. Um, and that's just my personal preference. It's when I can fit it in. And I'm when it's when I'm at my peak of uh, you know, delivering my top physical performance. Um, and for me, that's running. So I go running two to three times a week. And I'm currently training for a half marathon. Uh, so I've got a half marathon in a few weeks. So I'm currently running probably an 11 mile run on one day of the week. And then seven and a half, eight miles the other days. So just maintaining a steady, fairly decent level of fitness so it's easy to reach up into the half marathon territory when I need to. And that's how I keep myself in good shape. Uh, and by exercising first thing in the morning, you know, it takes about two hours to run a sort of half marathon distance. I come home, have a shower, and then I feel absolutely invigorated for the day ahead. Now, if my working day, because I work from home and I have a kind of flexible job, I often work in the evenings, so it gives me the mornings to myself to do activity. Um, if I'm not taking exercise in the morning, if my job needs me to be you know, active and on it straight away, um, I'll try and take exercise in the evening, either by going for a short run or going on a static exercise bike. So basically, that's how I start my day. I have a solid breakfast, followed by some exercise every other day or so, and uh, yeah, that sets me up for the day. So hope that on. Of course, you know, I'll do the usual things like having a shave every day and all that sort of thing when I can fit it in around the other things, but uh, Hope that answers your question, sir. Well, our next question is from Hassan Nawaz, who, simple question, what are my thoughts on Omega wristwatches? He says, I have two Rolexes and an Omega Constellation, and I much prefer the Omega. It's the perfect watch for me. Well, you've hit the nail on the head there, sir. When it comes to selecting a wristwatch, it's predominantly about personal preference. And it depends where you tends to be where you start off in life. So for me, growing up as I did in the 70s and 80s, I came of age, you know, I, I was 18 in 1988. And I've said this before in other videos, my influence as a younger person were the style icons of the 80s and 90s. And, you know, predominant among those were things like Miami Vice and lots of these other sort of stylistic 80s dramas, television programs, and, for me, the Rolex watch tended to be the watch which was favoured as the embodiment of success and style in that era. And as a consequence, for me, that was the watch in my mind which was the goal that I was aiming for. Today, I'm wearing a Rolex Datejust, so simple watch, but these were the watches of that era. That's why my preference is for Rolex. Now, if you're born maybe a little bit later, you will have been brought up perhaps seeing Pierce Brosnan as James Bond sporting the Omega wristwatch and hence your interest might have flowed in that direction. Then you'll have discovered you know about their their heritage with being the wristwatch choice of astronauts and NASA and the like, first watch on the moon and so on and once you get so your mind diverted in that direction it's very hard to find other things uh, of equal comparison. And that's kind of where I am with Rolex and where clearly you are with Omega. There are so many people who will say that Omega represents better value for money and better horological engineering than Rolex. And I can't argue with any of those points. It's quite simply personal preference. I am a Rolex guy, you sir clearly an Omega guy, and aren't we happy as a consequence? So, you know, it's, a, it's the wonder of the fact that uh, in the watch world, there's a peace for all of us. And uh, I'm glad you've found yours as I have found mine. Okay, next question comes from Struan Robertson. And he asks, Hi Ash, 20 years ago, did you on occasion use a briefcase? If so, would you feel comfortable using that briefcase today? Can a chap get away using one these days, do you reckon? Well, 
I hadn't actually read these in advance. And it's fortunate that you asked me that question because I'm in my office and I've got my briefcases just off to one side. So I can show you the briefcase that I used uh, 20 years ago and I can show you the briefcase that I use today. So let me just pop over here and pick them up. Okay, back in the chair. Right, so oh, this was my briefcase of, I'm gonna say the 1990s, all right? So as you can see, it is a plastic box made by Samsonite and it's incredibly robust. Even though it's many years old now, it barely shows any sign of wear. And I use it today to, to store files in and things which are important because it can be, uh, you know, it is uh, lockable and quite a solid unit. However, there is little style and charm in this briefcase, I have to say. It is a black box and made of plastic. So although it's very rugged and very capable, it's not pretty. And I retired from using this type of briefcase, I'm gonna say probably 15 years ago. Uh, and, oh, I, and it's very heavy as well. And I retired from that because of its lack of charm and the fact that my wife bought me a leather briefcase. Now, as time has gone on, I've gone through a number of leather briefcases, purely because I'm fickle. I mean, I have to say, you know, one leather briefcase could last you a lifetime, but I've tried one, I tried another, and you know, we just try other ones again. The one I'm using at the moment is a briefcase which I reviewed last year for a company called Carl Frederick. And this is a vegetable tanned leather briefcase in a lovely sort of cognac color. It's quite stylish, it's not huge, um, it's entirely made of leather, it's quite classically elegant, and it fits my laptop, it fits any files or notebooks, pens, things like that, that I need to carry around. It's also got enough space for, you know, things like a folding umbrella, depending on where I'm going, what I'm doing, spare sweater, maybe a hat, gloves or whatever. But those are the briefcases that I use. So you can clearly see an evolution there from utterly utilitarian in that plastic box to now being utilitarian, but with an element of flair and charm, which I think is the goal for all of us chaps. We want things that do their job practically, but also things that enhance our overall look. And I think you'll agree, a nice cognac leather briefcase does a lot more for one's look than a black plastic box. Okay, so my next question is a shoe question, and it comes from Alejandro Caballero, and he says, Hi Ash, I live in Dallas, Texas, and I come across a brand of shoes named Trickers online. I'd like to buy a good quality pair of Brogue shoes with Heritage, but I don't know if I should order these Trickers. What would you recommend? Well, sir, Trickers is a very good brand. They are considered to be one of the best shoemakers in Northamptonshire, which if you're unfamiliar with Northamptonshire, it is kind of the epicenter of quality leather footwear manufacture in the world. You know, many of the biggest brands, Churches, Crockett and Jones, Cheney, Loke, Trickers, many, many, many more are based up there in Northamptonshire where the, the working population of people um, have many generations of heritage of within the same family, you know, grandfathers, fathers, sons, all working in these factories and the skill levels are off the chart. They make amazing footwear. And Trickers is one of the oldest shoemakers in England. In fact, if I remember rightly, um, they they claim to be the oldest shoemaker in England and they will celebrate their 200th anniversary of making shoes in 2029. So it is fair to say that they have a strong reputation. So much so, they actually hold the royal warrant for footwear for His Royal Highness Prince Charles, Prince of Wales. So we know when it comes to the royal warrant, it's not issued willy-nilly. Only the very highest level of manufacturer ever gets anywhere near the achievement of a royal warrant, which means their footwear is actually used within the royal household. So a greater endorsement I don't think we can find. Now, you know, so in, in to answer your question, you can order trickers in confidence. They are a little bit more expensive, of course, 
If you're in Texas, you know, you will have access to things like Allen Edmonds, which are uh, your American sort of native brand of good year welted, good quality leather shoes. They are good. You know, there's nothing, not two ways about it. They're a good quality shoe. But I believe they are one tier down from brands like Trickers, Churches, Crockett and Jones, Cheney, Sanders, and so on. So order in confidence. And I'm sure that when you buy a pair of Trickers, you won't be disappointed. And it is a pair of shoes which is likely to last you for decades. Because being good you're welted, you can send them back to the factory when the sole wears out and they will replace it for you. They'll overhaul the shoe and it'll be like having a brand new pair of shoes each time you have that done. So you've got potentially decades of use. So give it a go. Now the next question should be a quick one to get through and it's from Raj G who says, Hi Ash, do you have any recommendations around brands for scissors or trimmers for beard maintenance? Realise you prefer the clean shave look but thought I'd ask just in case. And absolutely sir, I do shave every day but I do of course have use for scissors and things like that for trimming one's hair, cut my own hair. So uh, always good to have some, something nice and sharp to do that with. And my best recommendation for you is a shop which I have been using for decades now, and that is Tailors of Old Bond Street, who are based on German Street in London. Now, don't fear if you don't have access to London, they have a fabulous online presence. They've got a shop online and they ship internationally. And I can only say, having ordered things from them and visited the shop hundreds of times over the years, I have never been disappointed with a product that I have put from, bought from Taylor's or Bond Street. And I'm sure um, looking at their range of scissors, you will find something which will be of use to you, of the very finest quality, and it'll sort you out. So hope that answers your question. Right, our next question comes from Mohamed Morsi, and he says, Hello Ash. First, a huge thank you. I've enjoyed subscribing to your videos and appreciate your thoughts. Uh, as for my question, I've recently grown an affinity towards Crombie overcoats and was a bit disenchanted when I discovered that Crombie has ceased all operation until further notice. As one who enjoys looking posh in the cold winter months and enjoys a quality British wool coat, what other British manufacturers would you go to to get such a coat? Cheers. Okay, well, thank you, Mohammed. And you are right, of course. Uh, Crombie have for generations made some of the finest overcoats and material uh, that anyone could buy. And, you know, I own a Crombie overcoat myself. I own a Crombie sports jacket myself, and they are of superb quality. And it was a tragic loss to the sartorial world when Crombie was one of the many companies one of the many heritage companies that has been forced to the wall uh, by the modern trend that men have of dressing increasingly casually. Um, so where would you go to buy a woolen overcoat if you can't go to Crombie? Well, my answer would be simple. Don't give up on Crombie so quickly because Crombie are still, they've been making overcoats for generations and the styles have barely changed, I have to say. A 50 year old Crombie overcoat looks very similar to one that was just manufactured before they ceased trading about two years ago. So this is the key. You can still buy them if you are prepared to buy pre-owned. Now my overcoat, my Crombie overcoat came from eBay. I paid a hundred pounds for a coat which had been worn once and uh, was probably about 10 years old because a gentleman had bought it to go to his son's wedding. He hung it up in his wardrobe. Um, Tragically, he died, but his son sold it on to me. He only wore it once and I got it for 10% of its actual price because a Crombie would have been worth about a thousand pounds. I got it for a hundred pounds. So if you are prepared to shop around, use eBay as your friend or any other online auction houses, you have a strong chance of being able to access those remarkable legendary coats for actually now a fraction of the price. And also keep an eye on uh, thrift stores or secondhand shops. Pop in, have a look, see what's available. You will find that Crombie coat hanging up. Nobody knows what it is. You'll be able to pick it up for a few pounds and you'll have a coat that can last you for the rest of your life. And don't forget, if it's a little large, get it tailored. You know, you don't have to have the perfect fit when you're buying secondhand because the money that you've saved you can invest on having that garment 
perfectly tailored to fit you. So don't give up on Crombie. They're still out there. But now they're better value than ever. Okay, question now comes from Philip Lebrion, who asks, Hello Ash, my question is about the different type of shirt cuffs. There are a lot of different shapes and overall the famous musketeer cuffs. I know that it depends on the occasion, more or less formal, but what is your personal opinion to wearing uh, shirts with musketeer cuffs every day, for example? Thank you very much in advance. Well, you rightly say there are there are generally two types of cuff which most people would recognize. There's the barrel cuff, which I'm wearing on the shirt I'm wearing today, which is the simple button fastening, pretty much your day-to-day -day shirts. Then you've got the French cuff or the double cuff, and there are many different varieties of that style, uh, depending on what you look for. Musketeer, cocktail cuffs, there's many, many different types. Um, but generally speaking, in my opinion, um, and I do own about a 50-50 split in my shirt collection. So I'm gonna guess I've got about 40 to 50 shirts. About half of them have a barrel cuff, half of them have a French cuff. The advantage of the barrel cuff, it's perfect if you're layering it under something like a cardigan, as I am today, because it wears more naturally against the wrist. A French cuff or a double cuff where the material folds back on itself and is held in place by a cuff link is a little more formal. I would suggest it's a little more fancy. So I tend to wear those shirts when I'm wearing a suit, which doesn't have any constriction around the wrist. Um, and you know, of course, the fact that you can wear a cufflink with it allows you a little bit of expression of your personality because that's an accessory which you can, uh, you know, you can dress with a collection of your cufflinks. Build a collection, and you'll have something to match your, you know, your your thoughts and your mood that day. So that's kind of where I am with double cuff and barrel cuffs. I don't hold any sort of preference other than. One tends to be for more formal and fancy situations. One tends to be for more practical and utilitarian situations. Now, when you get into the world of bespoke shirts, and if you go to Turnbull and Asser in German Street in London, um, you will find that you can choose anything from a number of, I don't know, 15 different types of French cuff. Um, when you get up to that level of shirt ownership, um, that's when you can start playing around and deciding what suits you the best. Most famously, I think, um, of all of the shirt cuffs which are provided by Turnbull and Asser, you've got the cocktail cuff, which was famously worn by the Sean Connery version of James Bond. It's kind of a barrel cuff which is flicked back. Bit of a, a hybrid of the barrel cuff and the French cuff. I think that would be my choice if I had the option, but really I'm not spending hundreds of pounds on each individual shirts, so it's not gonna happen for me anytime soon, but I think you know that would be the one I would like to try. A quick question from Martin Bevan who says, do you ever wash your shoe polishing brush to remove excess polish? Um, I have to say, no, I've never done that. I have never found it necessary. Um, I've never found that much amount of polish building up on the hairs on my brush that have made me concerned for the need to have to polish it. If I was going to, uh, if I found out an issue and I did want to remove it, I would simply get a cloth, a terry cloth, and I would vigorously brush the, the, the shoe polishing brush against that cloth in the aim of transferring any polish from the hairs on the brush onto that cloth Make sure the cloth is something which you're not afraid to throw away afterwards, but that should clear any polish off. But generally speaking, you know, you shouldn't be applying so much polish that there's that much transfer onto the brush. Remember what we're trying to do with the brush is get the polish which we've applied the shoe to come to a, a, a shell effectively by using the friction and the heat from using the brush just to get that shiny, because the shine is a protective shell. Uh, so we don't want it on the brush, we want it on the shoe. So there we go. I don't wash it myself, but I would suggest perhaps using a rag just to get it off if that's a problem for you. And finally, our last question is from Isaac Salgado, who says, what are your thoughts on bracelets for men? Okay. Well, I'm famously from a mindset which has always said, less is more. So when it comes to accessories, you will notice I don't even wear a ring. I've married for many years. 
I don't wear a wedding ring because I don't like having lots of accessories dripping off me. The only closest thing to an accessory I wear is a wristwatch. And perhaps that's why I put so much stead and importance in my wristwatch, because it's the only piece that I tend to wear. Now, when it comes to a bracelet, uh, whether it's a bangle or a chain bracelet, or perhaps some of these leather bracelets or other material bracelets that are becoming increasingly popular, or a hybrid of both, you know, some material, some uh, metallic in nature, um, I would suggest these are not to be worn with a suit or more formal clothing. If you're utterly casual, and you know, as I am today, just wearing a, a, a sweater or a cardigan around the house, you can wear what you like. You're not in the public eye. You're uh, at no risk of being judged inappropriately by somebody if you're wearing accessories which are a little flamboyant or garish. But certainly when I go out into the world and I'm attempting to create a positive first impression with the people that I meet, I will not be wearing any bracelets or bangles or things like that. But uh, again, entirely subjective, my view totally, you can wear what you like. But for the classic, intentionally well-dressed man, I think the bracelets are to be left for the more informal clothing and not for those occasions when you're out and about in the public eye. Well, okay, gentlemen, there we go. We have reached the end of our questions for today. Thank you so much for posing those questions to me. I hope my answers were of some use to you. Please remember, I am just an amateur gentleman. That wasn't expert testimony, it's just my opinion. So take it for whichever way you'd like. Um, by all means, continue to send me your questions. I enjoy hearing from you enormously and helping you in any way that I can. Drop me those questions in the comments section below or send me an email and uh, you'll find my email in the about section on the main YouTube page. If you have enjoyed this video, give us a thumbs up. If you're not a subscriber, click the red button and don't forget you can practically support the channel by buying me a coffee and you will find a link to the buy me a coffee page in the show notes below. So until the next time, take care of yourselves, look stylish and I will see you again very soon.